everyone. Reverend Dorr here from Faith Community Church. Welcome to our online midweek Bible study. Tonight we're going to look at the fifth letter Jesus wrote to the churches in the book of Revelation. This fifth letter was written to the church at Sardis. Sardis is identified in the Phillips Bible as the dead church. Have you ever walked into a dead church? I know I have. It's as if you could feel the deadness in the atmosphere. And the reason is, the presence of God is not alive and well in a church that's dead. And this was the type of church that Sardis had become. It was a church that was built on the traditions of men rather than the life-giving presence of God himself. Sardis was a church trying to exist through its past reputation. As one commentator puts it, Sardis lost the sparkle of the supernatural. How many of you know that the Bible teaches in Mark chapter 7, verse 13, that the traditions of men make the word of God of no effect? This is just one of the lessons that we will be learning tonight as we study the church at Sardis. But before we do, let's join together in prayer. And let's offer up to the Lord the sacrifice of praise from our lips and invite him and welcome his Holy Spirit and his presence in our gathering together in Jesus' name. Father, we thank you and we praise you. Thank you, Lord God, that you have given us an abundant supply of your presence to carry us through this season that we're in. Almighty God, we just gather together in your name and we thank you, Father, for outpouring your grace upon grace on each and every one who's present here tonight. Oh God, we just lift up your spirit. We lift up your name. You said if you be lifted up, you would draw men and women unto you. Oh God, that you would draw us to yourself. Father, we want to know you and be known by you. We want to feast in your word and grow to become the men and women of faith that you predestined us to be. And we ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Oh, I'm so glad you're here tonight. Now, I want you to make sure that you stay logged in for the entire service because we have something really special planned for the end of this service. We are truly believing tonight for an outpouring of God's spirit, and I don't want you to miss it. Well, let's get into our study, amen? Now, Sardis was located about 30 miles south of Thyatira. If you remember, this was the church that we had studied last week. Last week, we learned that many in the church of Thyatira disobeyed the Lord by compromising the truth. Unlike Thyatira, though, which at least despite her sin, still had a few good things to mention, Jesus opens his letter to Sardis with a strong rebuke. So please, if you have your Bibles, I'd like you to open up to the book of Revelation, and we're going to begin a new chapter of the book tonight. That's chapter 3, and we're going to be reading from verse 1. And to the angel of the church at Sardis write, the words of him who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your works. You have the reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Now, as with each of his letters to the churches, we can see here that Jesus addresses this letter to the angel of the church that he is speaking to. In this case, it is the angel of the church at Sardis. Now, we established in our first lesson of this series that the Greek word for angel is angelos, and this can be translated as messenger. The messenger over the church can best be interpreted as the pastor or the leader of that particular church. So Jesus is actually addressing the pastor of the church at Sardis concerning the state of his flock. And in his opening salutation, Jesus identifies himself here as the one who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. We also learned previously 
that the seven spirits of God is speaking of the Holy Spirit in all of his fullness and all of his power. And the seven stars are referring to the seven messengers or pastors over each church. We learn that the seven stars are in his right hand. So Jesus is telling us something very important here. He's saying he has full authority over his churches, how his churches are to be run. He is the CEO over every church on the earth. And he goes on to say, I know your work, Sardis. You have a reputation of being alive, but you are dead. You see, Jesus is calling out to this church from the get-go their spiritual condition. You know, they were engaged in their works, but they were out of fellowship with God. In other words, they were engaged in their ministry to man, but they were not engaged in their ministry to the Lord. And this is a very dangerous place for a church to be. You see, there was a day when Sardis was actually alive. The city of Sardis was very prominent in its beginning. It was a great city of great, great wealth. Gold ran through its streets and rivers. <laughs> Not through its streets. Gold ran through its rivers. Sardis was known for manufacturing pure gold and silver coins. And there was a time when Sardis considered itself untouchable. And this was due to the fact that Sardis had been located high on a hill. And so it was difficult to get to. But eventually, the keepers of the city grew arrogant. They became less and less watchful over the city's gates. You see, the city of Sardis had been attacked and was conquered actually twice. And as a result, this city was overrun and came to ruins. Now, you know there's a grave danger when you pride yourself in your past victories and you fail to be watchful. And this is what happened to Sardis, both its city and its church. Proverbs 16, 18 says, Pride comes before destruction and an arrogant spirit before a fall. Church, there's a danger to pride yourself in your past victories. You see, it's not enough to simply be content looking back at the good old days. As a true follower of Jesus Christ, we must ever be bearing fruit for his glory. Amen? Church, don't ever, ever become complacent in your walk with the Lord by dreaming of days gone by. Don't buy into the lie. That somehow, because you served back when, that you've already paid your dues. Nothing could be further from the truth. Because the Bible is clear. Now, now is the time to serve the Lord. Amen? Jesus, I want you to remember when we first read this passage, introduced himself to this church as the one who has the fullness of the Spirit, who holds the pastors in his right hand. Now, this is really interesting because as we've been studying these churches, we find a pattern. You see, in each of these letters to the churches, Jesus' introduction of himself speaks directly to their spiritual condition. Last week, when we studied the church of Thyatira, he introduced himself as the one whose eyes were like a flame of fire and whose feet were like burnished bronze. You know, with those eyes, he's saying to us, I can see right through you. I can see through your motives and I can see your intentions. His feet like burnished bronze was a warning for Thyatira to repent of his judgment because his to repent, rather, because his judgment would eventually fall upon them if they didn't repent. 
introducing himself to Sardis as the one who has the Holy Spirit in all of its fullness. Jesus is addressing exactly what they are lacking. Sardis had lost the sparkle of the supernatural. It was a church of ritual and no power. The very life of the Holy Spirit was no longer present. And instead, this church got caught up in just practicing man-made routines. Jesus finds this church lifeless, powerless, and ineffective. And by his introduction of himself as the one who has the seven spirits, Jesus is actually telling Sardis that they need the power of the Holy Ghost. You see, they were grieving and they were quenching the power of the Holy Spirit in their ministry. And this is what made them lifeless. What does it mean to quench or grieve the Holy Spirit? Well, first, we must understand, according to Scripture, that the Holy Spirit has a will. He has a personality, and he can be grieved or offended. Church, the Holy Spirit is not an it or a thing. He is a person. He is the third person of the Trinity. And the Bible is clear on what actually grieves him. So I want you for a moment, hold your place in Revelation 3, and let's turn to the book of Ephesians, and we're going to read from chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4, beginning at verse 29, gives us a very good understanding as to what grieves or offends the Holy Spirit. Now, I want you to really listen up. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Remember the lesson when we learned that we have the Holy Spirit, guys, living inside us. If you are a born-again child of God, God gives you his Holy Spirit to reside in you, and it is the seal of your salvation. It is the guarantee, the deposit, the down payment that you have eternal life. So he says here, we were sealed for the day of redemption, and he says, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ forgave you. This tells us something very important. In other words, somehow, this indwelling presence of God should be ordering and altering our behavior. Now, to get an even clearer picture as to what truly grieves the Holy Spirit, I want us to read this entire passage again, but we're going to read it now in the Amplified Version. So for those of you who might have just logged on, we're reading from Ephesians 4, and we're starting with uh, uh, verse 29, and we're going from 29 to verse 32. Now, really camp out on this language. Let no foul or polluting language or evil word nor unwholesome or worthless talk ever come out of your mouth. Let's read that again because I don't know. I think sometimes Christians struggle with this one. Verse 29. Listen. Let no foul, no curse, no profanity, no choice word, no polluting language, nor evil word, nor unwholesome or worthless talk. Hey, that's a wake-up call to anybody who's given to gossip. Don't ever let it come out of your mouth, but only such speech 
as is good and beneficial to the spiritual progress of others, as is fitting to the need and the occasion that it may be a blessing and give grace, which is God's favor, to the one who hears it. And do not grieve. Highlight that. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God. In other words, it says, do not offend or vex or sadden him by whom you were sealed, marked, branded as God's own, secured for the day of redemption, of final deliverance through Christ from evil and the consequences of sin. Let all bitterness and indignation and wrath, passion, rage, bad temper and resentment, anger, animosity and quarreling, brawling, clamor, contention and slander, which is evil speaking, abusive or blasphemous language, be banished from you with all malice, spite, ill will or baseness of any kind and become useful and helpful and kind to one another, tender-hearted, compassionate, understanding, loving-hearted, forgiving one another readily and freely as God in Christ forgave you. Wow. I don't know about you, but I could camp out on this passage and we could do a study right here. And you know what? Maybe we will on a future Wednesday because there is so much to learn. There's so much to take in in this passage alone as to what grieves the Holy Spirit of God. In short, beloved, we grieve the Holy Spirit when we use our tongue as an instrument of unrighteousness. We grieve the Holy Spirit when we treat another unrighteously. Remember, last week, we learned that God desires for the Word of God to train us for righteousness so that we can know how to rule rightly with Him in the Millennial Kingdom. You see, God gives us his Holy Spirit to help us know whether or not we are truly walking in righteousness. You see, when you don't walk in righteousness, the Holy Spirit within you is grieved. And it's something that you become very aware of when the Holy Ghost is truly living on the inside of you. It's like you get this feeling inside or this knowing inside. Oh, my goodness, I have just disappointed the Lord. I shouldn't have said that. I shouldn't have done that. Now, for those of you who are Italian, you're going to know what I mean by this. It's like having spiritual agita. You get this agita, this yuck feeling. Oh, no, you feel inside. I blew it. I know I blew it. It's a check in your spirit that something isn't right. Perhaps your words, your behavior, something inside has just saddened the Lord and you know it. Now here's the thing. You can choose to accept it or you can turn it off. You see, if you continue in your sin, if you continue in the behavior that he's giving you the check with, you're making the choice to silence his voice. You are quenching the Holy Spirit within you. Quenching the Holy Spirit is like snuffing out the flame of a candle. 1 Thessalonians 5.19 says, Do not quench the Holy Spirit. Another translation says, do not extinguish. Do not put out. Do not turn off the inner voice of God's conviction. Beloved, you have to know, sin hardens the heart. 
refusal to repent, to yield to the Holy Spirit's correction, will harden our hearts. Eventually, we will become dull of hearing. We will become desensitized to what the Spirit of God is saying. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 6 and 7 says this, For this reason, I remind you to fan into the flame of the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of hands. For God gave us a spirit, not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. Sadly, church, this was the condition of Sardis. This was their sin that they quenched the power of the Holy Spirit by letting the flame die out. Sardis is a church that is in great need of revival. Though at one time, Sardis had a reputation, Jesus now finds this church without power desensitized to the voice of the Holy Spirit, so much so that Jesus says to them, you are dead. You know, they were actively engaged in their works, but they were bearing no fruit. And the Gospel of John, chapter 15, verse 5, warns us, apart from him, we can do Nothing. Church, we must always be careful that our ministry to man never supersedes our ministry to God. Ministry to God must always come first in the life of a church and in the life of every individual member of that church. You see, the church at at Sardis was made up of carnal Christians those who lacked the power of the Holy Spirit. Romans 8, 6 tells us to be carnally minded is death. You see, a church that's filled with carnally minded people without the power of the Holy Spirit is a church that is DOA. It is dead on arrival. Oh, honey, you may sing the song, you may do the dance, and you may ring the bell, but unless the Holy Spirit is breathing on what you do, you will not bear any, any, any fruit. Jesus, in this hour, is going around looking for churches that will bear fruit. Churches who are preaching the gospel with signs and with wonders, signs like healing and salvation and deliverance. In his introduction to himself, to this church, I'm sorry, in his introduction of himself to this church, we notice Jesus mentions the seven stars in his hand, which are the seven pastors of the church. And in verse 2, Jesus commands this this church's leadership to wake up and pay attention. Now, I want you to turn back to Revelation, and we're going to take a look at Revelation chapter 3, and we're going to begin with this verse in verse 2. It says here, wake up. He's talking to the pastor. He's talking to the leaders. He's saying, hey, guys, wake up and strengthen what remains that is about to die. For I have not found your works complete in the sight of my God. Remember then what you received and heard. Keep it and repent. If you will not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know what hour I come against you. Here, Jesus gives this church a five-step plan to come back to life. And guys, it's the same five-step plan for any church that is feeling dead. First, he commands, wake up. 
You see, the sin of pride had lulled them to sleep. They had lost their way because they became arrogant. They were no longer watchful. They thought they could get past on, uh, on their past victory. They stopped seeking the Lord daily for a fresh anointing. They just got into their routine. They focused on their former glory and they lost sight of where they actually were. So Jesus tells this church's pastor, wake up. Second, he tells him, strengthen what remains and is about to die. Jesus is telling this leader that there is a remnant in this church that can be revived. And he commands him to strengthen it. Oh, beloved, I hope you understand that this should be job one during this quarantine. If you're in Christ Jesus, if you belong to Faith Community Church, whatever church you might belong to, now is the time to be revived. God is looking for the remnant. He's looking for those that's not going to go along with the status quo and just take this quarantine lying down. No, we have to look for every means available to us to stay connected, to be able to preach the word, to be able to dig deep into the presence of God on a daily basis. The Lord is saying to us, church, wake up. Strengthen what remains. Reach out to one another. Keep one another connected together in this season. Beloved, Jesus desires that none should perish. Once again, we see our Jesus on a search and rescue mission. Though this church called Sardis is dead, Jesus looks for the life that may be hidden that they may be revived. Church, it's a dangerous thing to camp out on your former victories instead of living every day for future ones. You know, years ago, I heard a minister say, here's the great thing about ministry. You can learn how to do it. And then he said something really interesting. He said, now, here's the bad thing about ministry. You can learn how to do it. Beloved, a church is in danger. Its members are in danger. When they stop relying on the power of the Holy Spirit to do the work of ministry through them. You see, we need to rely on the power of the Holy Spirit within us each and every day. The church in Sardis fell asleep to this truth. Pride and arrogance clouded their vision. A church that only has a past and doesn't live for today is in danger of not having a future. Beloved, a church is a living organism. It needs a daily dose of the Holy Ghost so it can thrive and stay alive. Sardis had become so enamored by their own reputation that it stopped living for the blessed hope that was promised to those who endured to the end. It wasn't thinking about living ready and finishing strong. It thought it had already arrived. It had a reputation, and it was basing its existence on its past. Third, Jesus tells him to remember what you have received and heard. He's reminding this church to let the word of Christ dwell in their hearts again, to go back to the basics. Fourth, he tells them not only to remember but keep this word. In other words, guys, he's saying, obey the truth that you first heard. Obey the truth that you first heard. You know, we, we're, we're so, uh, what's the word? 
higher than a kite. <laughs> when we first get saved, when we first hear the gospel, we're so overwhelmed when we receive the goodness and the mercy of God and, and it carries us. It's like, you know, you begin this wonderful honeymoon with the Lord and you, you're just enamored with his grace and enamored with his mercy that he could forgive you and wash away your sin. Church, never forget the goodness and the mercy of God. Never forget especially when you find yourself in that trial and every fiery dart of the wicked is aimed at you. How do you navigate through such a season? How do you navigate through such a minefield? You navigate by standing on what you know. You know like you know, Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He will never fail you. Never. This is our God. He will carry you through that season, and he will take you safely to the other side. But you have to hold on to that truth, and you have to Obey what he reveals to you. Fifth, Jesus warns them to repent of their lifelessness. He warns them to repent of their lifelessness so that he can revive them and restore them back to life. Church, revival begins in the heart. You know, so many of us are crying out for revival. We want so desperately to see revival in our church. Do you know that revival can begin with you? Revival can begin with me? I heard a minister say years ago, it takes two sticks to start a fire. Oh, glory. All we need to do is keep pouring the word of God into one another. Fan the flame of the Holy Spirit of God that is living inside of us. Beloved, don't allow this season, this quarantine to go to waste. Allow the Holy Ghost to fan the flame that's inside of you. To stir up the gifting of God that is in you. Let that flame burn bright in your heart. How do you begin? You spend time with Jesus. You spend time in his word. You spend time worshiping him. You cry out for him in true, authentic repentance. Repentance is about face. It's an about face. It's when we turn, we do a 180, complete turnaround from whatever it is we are repenting from. Make this your night to surrender your heart to him. Make this your night. Mark it on a calendar. This is the night you surrendered all to him. This is the night you let go of the past and you take hold of today so you have the promise of tomorrow, the promise that's only found in him. You have a future and a hope in Christ and Christ alone. Take a look at verse 4. Yet you have still a few names in Sardis, people who have not soiled their garments, and they will walk with me in white, for they are worthy. Jesus tells us here that there is a remnant in Sardis, who did not soil their garments. In other words, those who maintained or kept their testimony, who will walk with him in white. You know, it's interesting that Jesus refers to these white garments in Sardis because history records that Sardis was devoted to the worship of a certain mother goddess and no temple worshiper was allowed to approach the temple with soiled or unclean garments. A white or a clean robe was required to approach this so-called God. 
Church, Jesus is saying, those who remained faithful and did not soil their garments by putting on those offered to idols will receive a white garment from him. Now, what I want you to see in this that is so powerful is that Jesus knows our situations. He knows exactly what you're going through. He knows exactly the situation that you find yourself in right now. Jesus knows our situations, and he speaks directly to the situations that we personally face. You know, as we study these letters, I hope you're seeing this pattern. Jesus knows his churches intimately and personally. He addresses exactly what needs to be addressed in our lives, and he gives us an escape plan to overcome. So don't think for one moment that Jesus doesn't understand what you're going through. Jesus knows exactly what you and I are going through, and he has made a way of escape. Look at verse 5. The one who conquers will be clothed thus in white garments, and I will never blot his name out of the book of life. I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. Now, white garments were very symbolic in ancient society. They were worn by those celebrating a victory. They were also worn by those celebrating very special occasions, much like a wedding. Jesus is telling his overcomers, they will be adorned in white. Now, the Apostle John in Revelation chapter 19, verses 7 to 9, records seeing the bride of Christ clothed in these white garments at the marriage supper of the Lamb. Beloved, Jesus wants you to be there. Oh, how he wants you to be at the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he wrote these letters so that you and I can get prepared, so that you and I can live ready and finish strong, be ready for the day when our Lord comes to take us away. Once again, Jesus closes his letter to his church, saying in verse 6, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. You see, the sin of the church at Sardis is that they were guilty of having style without substance. But God who is rich in mercy, never gave up on them. In his challenging letter to Sardis, Jesus calls out to his remnant to remain untarnished by the deception that plagued this church. And Jesus, through this letter, is calling out to us, his church today, and he's saying to his remnant, remain untarnished by the deception and the deceit that is all around you today. How do you remain untarnished? You remain in his word. You remain in his truth. Oh, Lord, that you would help us remain. Make that your cry that he will find you ready, that you would finish strong. Amen? Verse 6 ends this letter with this. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the, to the churches. So my question tonight is this. What lesson? What lesson can we take away from the church at Sardis? I believe that the Lord is speaking to us, his church right now in this hour for our desperate need for revival. What is revival? Well, first we must understand that revival is a work of the Holy Spirit. It is not a work of man. It is a work of the Holy Spirit. 
For the Christian, revival causes us to be spiritually reawakened to the life of God that is within us. You see, God can only do something through us once he has done something in us. Revival seeks to reignite our love and our passion to follow and serve the Lord. When the Holy Spirit revives us, we are restored to the awareness of God's indwelling presence. We are restored to the awareness that God's Holy Spirit abides inside of us. Remember, like the church of Sardis, we are in great need to be continually filled with the Holy Spirit for life and ministry. Church, we are in an hour where we need the power of the Holy Spirit like never before. Here's the reality. When we walk in obedience to God's word and his spirit, revival will continuously flow within us. Church, listen. Revival is not a feeling. Revival is not an event. Revival is a condition. It is a heart that is revived, a heart that is in sync with God's heart. It's a heart that lines up with his desires. It's when your will is to do his will and please him. When a Christian experiences true revival, their passions will fall in line with God's word. True revival will always, always put in us a hunger for souls and a hunger for soul winning. A revived heart hears the voice of the Father and moves swiftly to obey. Church, we need revival like never before. And listen, you don't have to wait for the next big wave of God, for God to come to you in order for you to experience revival. You see, revival will come to you right now, wherever you are. And there's only one thing that's required. He is looking for a broken, humble, contrite heart. You see, God will never refuse the one who is open and broken before him. Brokenness, church, is when our hearts are humbled, surrendered, bowed down before the Lord. A broken heart is a teachable heart, a heart that can hear the voice of the Holy Spirit, a heart that refuses to grieve him, a heart that refuses to quench him, a heart that is yielded to his commands. A heart that can hear the whisper of God. That's a revived heart. Revival comes to the humble. Isaiah 57, 15 says, For thus says the one who is high and lifted up, who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy. I dwell in the high and holy place and also with him who is of a contrite and lowly spirit to revive the spirit of the lowly and to revive the heart of the contrite. The contrite means the repentant. You see, for Sardis, to experience this kind of revival, it would need to repent of the sin of pride. Pride was their downfall. Beloved, spiritually speaking, we are either dead or alive. What is the spiritual condition of your heart tonight? Are you thriving in your walk with the Lord? Are you thriving in your obedience and service to him? Or are you barely on life support? For the one yet to believe, this death 
This spiritual death is to be without spiritual life. It is to be without God himself. It is to be separated from a relationship with him. Beloved, this is why Jesus came. He came to bridge the gap. He is the only mediator between God and man. He came to bridge the gap, to make a way for you and I to have access to God's holiness, to have access to God the Father himself, to have access to God's righteousness. God's glory comes and weighs heavy upon us. To help us see. To help us see our need for him. Oh, I hope you're hungry for God's glory. I hope every day you're crying out, God, send us your glory. Help us know you and be known by you. May your glory fall heavy upon us that we may see the truth. Oh, Lord, I pray right now for those who are yet to believe that you, Father God, will give them the gift of repentance and that you will help them see the deadness that they have been living in and that you are offering them life. You are offering living water to the one who's so thirsty tonight. Oh, beloved, if that's you, surrender your heart to him right now. You know, I'm just going to take a break for a moment to do this because I feel this so strong right now. God wants you to come to him. And so he comes to you. We love because he first loved us. It's the father who draws you to the son. And if you're feeling that conviction inside, you're feeling that churning, something is happening in the atmosphere, something's happening in your heart, don't turn it off. Don't quench the power of the Holy Spirit that's there to remove the veil from your eyes so that you could see him as he truly is. He is the Christ, Jesus, our Lord and Savior. He is a merciful Savior. And he comes to you tonight. And he says, I will forgive you. So expose to him what's hidden in your heart. Repent. Cry out to him. Say, Lord, I know I'm a sinner. I need a savior. I can't save myself. I don't have the power. I've tried to fix everything. And every time I try, I fail. Lord, I am in need of eternal life, this gift, this living water that you promised to those who believe. Father, I pray, help my unbelief. Teach me, Lord, your ways. Lord Jesus, your word says that you are the Christ, the chosen one. I come to you now and I surrender my heart to you fully. And I ask you, Lord God, be merciful unto me, a sinner. Cleanse me. I repent. I ask you to remove the reproach of my sin and cleanse me from all unrighteousness. Lord Jesus, come into my heart. Make me what I ought to be. I believe you rose from the dead. I believe you are the one sent by God to deliver us. Lord God, I thank you for coming. I receive it by faith. And I thank you for leading me by your spirit and teaching me your ways that I may walk with you and follow you all the days of my life. Amen. Now, I don't know if you prayed that prayer with me, but that is the type of prayer that you need to pray. That is God's invitation to welcome you into his eternal kingdom. It's by faith that we're saved. We are saved, church, when we believe in the one, when we believe in his grace. His grace comes to deliver you, to set you free. Ephesians says we are saved by this grace through our faith. Our faith helps us access who he is. Faith is believing in what you cannot see. Oh, I pray 
that you're coming to him. And if you are, notify us, reach out to us. We want to pray with you. We want to encourage you to be all that God desires you to be. Now, for the believer, this death, this spiritual death, is being out of fellowship with God. By not walking with him, being out of fellowship due to sin or disobedience, walking in a state of grieving the Holy Spirit. Beloved, examine your heart tonight. Are you quenching the voice of the Spirit within you? 1 John chapter 1, verse 9 says this, if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Amen. So all together in this time, in this hour, in this moment, I want us to turn to the Lord and we're going to cry out together for the revival fire to come and fan the flame that is in our hearts. We are believing as a church for revival to hit us right now, right where we are, right in our living rooms, right in our bedrooms, right wherever we are. As we are standing before God's presence, we are believing for the outpouring of God's spirit. And I have something very special prepared tonight as we pray. I've asked Reverend Diane to come up and minister a song for us. Guys, I don't want you to get distracted. This is a time of spiritual connection for you and us, for us to come together, for the church to be one under the banner of this worship, to cry out to God for his revival, to rain down on us with his Holy Spirit, cry out for it tonight because God wants to call out his remnant and breathe life into our bones and raise us up for this hour. Amen? Amen. Let's just bow our heads and lift our hands as we worship together and ask the Holy Spirit to reign Holy Spirit,
consecrated for you, to live with you, to live by you, to live in you. You alone hold the keys to life and godliness. You are the one called faithful and true. Oh, Father, bring a holy hush upon our gathering today. Father, we pray for revival to hit our homes. Let every household be aflame with your love, be aflame with your power, be aflame with your truth, oh God. Set our hearts aflame with passion for you, oh God. Teach us, Father. Make us, Father. Equip us, Father. In this hour, in this moment, we pray. Oh, Father, we thank you and we praise you. We worship you. Holy Spirit, rain down. You are our comforter and our friend. We need your touch again. So we unite in faith. All over the airways, we unite right now. Through the social media, we unite right now. We unite in faith. And we ask you, Lord, to rain down. Wash us. Make us whole. Make us as you want us to be. In the mighty name of Jesus. Oh, praise you, Father. Praise you, Father. Praise you, Father. Come on. Come on. Continue to praise him. Continue to worship him. Continue to thank him. He is here. He is stirring us up. He is getting us ready for an open door of opportunity, church. An open door of ministry awaits Faith Community Church. Never forget, during this season, God is preparing us as a people to rise up with his power, with his glory, to reach out to all that we meet. In Jesus' name, we just thank you, Father, for this time of fellowship, this time in your word. And we ask you, Lord God, to go with us as we go from here in our daily chores, in our daily work, oh God, that you will ever be with us, that you will ever be present with us. In the powerful name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Oh gosh, I am so excited about what God is doing through this wonderful time together. 
My Lord, I am so blessed that you're here and that you have prayed with us and that you are seeing what God is doing in our midst, that you're a part of this. We're making history together here at Faith Community Church, and we're so glad that you're on board. Dear Lord, I just want to thank you for being here. I want to encourage you, if you haven't listened to some of the past teachings on this series, you can go to the link that we've provided in the video description of tonight's lesson, and you can refer back to all of the lessons that we've been teaching on Living Ready and Finishing Strong. We're here every Wednesday night. I want to encourage you to join us at 7.30 every Wednesday night. And also Sunday, Pastor Gary has a wonderful message he is preparing and uh, we're going to be blessed on Sunday with the word of God amen and you know what we don't compare notes and Pastor Gary I was sitting there Sunday listening to his message on the Holy Spirit and I said hon you're preaching my message and I was just so excited because I saw we're really in sync with one another with what God's spirit is saying to our church today and we're and even the kids Reverend Diane told me that kids are learning about the Holy Spirit so we're so excited that God God is really in our midst, that we are alive with God's power, and we want you to be a part of everything that we offer to you throughout the week. Don't forget to go to Man Up on Monday nights. Don't forget our women's life groups on Thursday nights, and don't forget our identity life group meets every Friday night. And for those of you who have been giving online, we want to thank you so much for your support of this ministry. You guys are such a blessing to us. I want you to feel our heart and our appreciation. You you keep us going. You are the ones that are really keeping us moving forward during this quarantine. And we're so grateful for you, for your faithful support to this church. If you'd like to give tonight, we would encourage you to please go to the address you see across the screen. Just click onto that address. Go to our website and we'll be happy to receive your offering and to bless you. Know that our elders are praying for you. Our church family is praying for you. God bless you guys. We're so grateful for you. Thank you so much for being here. And we will see you next week. God bless.